So welcome everybody to today's Pathology Grand Rounds lectures. These are monthly lectures sponsored by both the Jean Shanks Foundation and the Pathological Society. This morning we will have two speakers on the subjects of digital pathology. Our first speaker will be Dr. Pete Bankhead from the University of Edinburgh and the second speaker will be Dr. Jacob Kather from the University of Aachen in Germany. Can I remind you all that uh, we will have a 10 to 15 minute question and answer session at the end of the two talks. Please, can you put your questions in the Q&A box at the bottom of your Zoom screen? So to start off, uh, we will start with Pete Bankhead. Uh, Pete is a senior lecturer at the University of Edinburgh. His research aims to develop practical algorithms and open source software to help analyze complex biological and biomedical images with a special focus on, on digital pathology. He wrote a popular bioimage analysis handbook and created the QPath software, which his group is working on to further develop. And QPath is the subject of his lecture today, which is entitled QPath making digital pathology open for everyone. Thank you. Over to you, Pete. Thank you, Mark, for the, the introduction and yeah, for the opportunity to, to speak today. It's always uh, slightly intimidating to um, speak to this audience who knows a lot more about a big part of what I'm going to talk about than I do. But um, I always like to begin with just the, the explanation that I come from an image analysis background. And so I ended up in digital pathology, but I only heard about it about slightly under 10 years ago. And it seems to have sort of taken over my life since then. But um, my career started off in, in image analysis and retinal images and then microscopy image analysis and then eventually came to um, pathology. But I think that coming from this outside to sort of shape the way in which I've tried to approach things um, and also shapes some of the themes that you're going to see in this talk. Um, and through working across these different domains, I, I have the feeling that bioimage analysis is hard. I feel like the more years I do it, I should start to find it easier, but I really don't. Um, and I think there's no real right way to analyze images, um, but there's lots of wrong ways. Uh, although the basic ideas are often quite simple. And so essentially an image that we're working with, be, it, be it a pathology image or something else, it's really just numbers from the computational point of view. Um, they're visualized as colors, um, but that's purely a visualization trick. And the raw data is simply uh, an array of numbers. And we need to find patterns within these numbers. But one of the things that makes it difficult is a single image will contain billions of numbers. And also the key patterns can differ enormously. Um, and we need to understand the data as well to make the valid interpretations of it. And variation is one of the things that is, is really the, the, the biggest challenge. Because even if I just take something that seems like it should be straightforward, detecting cells in an image, that's something that I've encountered throughout my career. Um, the computational challenge varies depending upon what sort of image you've got, what the cells look like. And it can be completely different um, uh, in terms of the, the challenge that um, we have in the, the pattern finding challenge. But even if we're to limit ourselves to purely say these IHC um, histology images, the computational challenge is still very different. Um, it is easier if you're dealing with a nuclear marker to be able to identify nuclei and then maybe quantify them. It's still not easy, um, but it is easier than other um, markers and different staining patterns. And in terms of the, the numbers that we're looking for the, um, that correspond to, to a cell or the stain that you want to quantify, it's very different. And so we've got this challenge of any image that you want to analyze, you need the domain knowledge. And so in this case, you need the pathology knowledge to understand what you're looking at and to make sense of it. Um, but with image analysis, you also need to know a bit about the imaging process. Um, depending upon the application, sometimes that's really quite key. Um, you might need to know about the diffraction limit and point spread function and all that kind of stuff. Um, you need to know about how the images are digitized and where these numbers come from and how they relate to the colors that we see. We need to know the image processing techniques that can be applied. We need to know machine learning techniques, statistics for bringing it all together. And all this needs to be implemented somehow in software. And then we need to know how to use the software. And so there's lots of different things that we need. Pathology is clearly key and central to it when it comes to digital pathology, but there's everything else as well. 
And so from my side, because I don't know the pathology, I work with the pathologists who do, um, I try and make the rest of this as easy to use and as easy to make sense of as possible um, so that the people with the domain knowledge can really apply that and the software doesn't get in the way, it can actually try and help them. So that's the, the goal that I try and work towards. And for bioimage analysis broadly, um, it works because there's this fantastic ecosystem of open source tools. So the challenges that I described are true for any sort of microscopy image analysis and any sort of image analysis really. And there's fantastic tools like ImageJ that have been around in some form for about 30 years now and Cell Profiler that's been around since about 2005. And these are open source and these have really shaped the field over the last um, couple of decades. Um, but the trouble whenever I encountered digital pathology was that none of them worked really for digital pathology because they didn't support these whole slide images. And as I guess um, everybody here knows, the trouble with whole slide images are that they are huge. And so you can have a 60 gigabyte image or 60 gigabytes of raw data. It might look like a smaller file in your computer because it's been compressed, but when you open it, it has to be decompressed. And then you've got about 60 gigabytes of data and you're trying to analyze it on a computer with maybe eight gigabytes of memory. 60 doesn't fit into eight. So you need software which is able to then um, work with these files and just go in and pull out the part that's relevant for visualization at any particular moment and then perform pretty, pretty sophisticated analysis on these small regions to pick out the patterns. And so we're looking for patterns within billions of, of numbers and often we want to boil this down to maybe one or two actionable insights at the end. Uh, and so as I was starting to work on digital pathology, I was influenced by the open source tools that I knew before, particularly ImageJ and Fiji, um, which are um, related software. And I wanted to apply them pathology and I spent a couple of years trying to do that and trying to write my own little scripts and things to um, analyze pathology images. But I found that it was always so incredibly cumbersome. And whenever I tried to work with a pathologist, if I had spent three weeks running scripts to get some markup um, results at the end, and if then they can point out that, no, actually I've detected completely the wrong cells or I've classified them the wrong way, and then they have to wait for me to work for another three or four weeks to get them a new set of results, that's not a good way to work. And so what I ended up trying to do is to develop a new open source platform that would enable me to work much more effectively and to engage um, more easily with the pathologists. And in order to do this, it needed to be user friendly, interactive, and you need to be able to visualize what it was doing as it went along. And so at the time when I started it, it didn't exist for pathology, or at least certainly not in an open source way. Um, and so that's what I set about trying to create. So this was eventually released at the very end of 2016, um, shortly before I went off to industry for a year, um, but I've later returned to the project. And what I want to do now is just give you a very brief demo of sort of QPath as it appears. And so it's only going to be three minutes. So if you've seen it before, you don't have um, too much to, to wait. Um, so effectively, this is QPath with the whole slide image open. Um, we can visualize it, but there's lots of different tricks in here. So it's all going to move very quickly, but it's, it's documented online if you want to find in more detail. So what you saw there was the magic wand tool as an annotation um, device. And some of the tricks are, for example, this is zoom dependent. So if you want to annotate a small region, just zoom in, a large region, zoom out. If you want to annotate regions that are neighboring each other, there's little um, tools that allow you to make sure that they don't overlap. But then you can even do stuff like you can take your annotations and then train a machine learning classifier interactively. Um, so all of this is happening in real time. There's no speeding up applied. Um, but I've drawn a few annotations of a few different regions and then I'm training a machine learning classifier to apply across the image and I can adapt the features that are going into it. I can adapt um, uh, yeah, whatever I, I, I need to in order to try and improve the classification. Um, but it's no good just um, being able to visualize what has been detected. You also need to be able to make some sort of measurements. And so for example, here I've selected a region and then I can take these machine learning predictions, convert them into new annotations, say measure the area so I get the percentage stained area and so on. And the fact that it's also visual makes it um, easy to see what it's doing. Because one of the, the issues with digital pathology is that it's, it's hard to come up with a method that generalizes. And so accepting that, um, it helps if you at least know what the software has done. And so you can judge whether or not it's done something sensible. Um, so I don't want to yeah, develop a tool that will spit out a number at the end and you have to uh, take it on trust. It needs to be very visualizable so that you can know if it's done the sensible thing. 
So here I've opened another image. Um, here's the key 67 image. I've run QPass cell detection, which was a, a custom algorithm that I developed just um, for the software. It's detected, I think about 80,000 cells or, or um, 65,000 cells in this image. It's made about 44 different measurements of them all within a few seconds. I can visualize these measurements. I can then start to supplement the measurements. So each cell knows a little bit about the neighboring cells as well. And then I can start to apply machine learning again. So if I, or ideally not me, because I'm not the pathologist, um, I'm to annotate a few cells of different types, I can assign the classifications to them, and then QPath will train a machine learning classifier that will distinguish between the different cell types. And that means that within a matter of um, seconds or within a couple of minutes, we have um, been able to calculate the key 67 labeling index um, for this image based upon detecting 65,000 cells, classifying them with a custom classifier that we've trained to distinguish the tumor cells. And then we can even do stuff like we can query it and um, determine density maps to find hotspots, depending on how we want to define that. So um, uh, based upon area or normalized by the number of cells and so on. So we've got all of these kind of versatile tools within the software and they're all interactive and relatively um, user friendly. Um, but it doesn't give you the answer on its own. So certainly at the moment, there's no like key 67 analysis button that you press it and you get a score. It gives you the tools to develop the custom workflows that you need. And that's one of the, um, the things about it then is that in some ways it's maybe not as user friendly as you might like, but that is central to the fact that it can be applied to a wide range of studies because it's so um, customizable and so uh, adaptable to different applications. So who uses it then at the moment? Um, so about a year ago, I think it was, um, I, I made a survey and about 670 or so people replied. And so you can see that it's used by um, a, a range of different people at, at various different career stages and about uh, 88 of the respondents um, identified as pathologists, but the postdocs were the, the largest group. Um, but there's a, a large, uh, a wide range of different people and about 20% of the respondents worked in industry. Uh, and they often use it for different things. And so the pathologists that I speak to might use it for IHC analysis, like the key 67 example that I showed. Um, but they can also use it for things like maybe defining tumor margins, because if you create an annotation in QPath, because it's all digital, you can do stuff like you can expand it by a fixed distance. Um, and so this allows you to make, uh, yeah, like more quantitative measurements or be a bit more precise that you don't have to estimate by eye what say a, a millimeter would be, but you can actually define that um, in the image and, and create that kind of thing. It's also defined, used by biologists for completely different studies and so not purely for pathology images. And so this is an image from my wife who's an immunologist, so I need to make a work on her images as well so we can do her kind of analysis. Um, otherwise, what's the point in having created a new open source platform? Uh, it can be used to say, perform quality assessment. So it's, a lot of people use QPath as a viewer um, because it works on Linux, Mac, Windows, um, all the different platforms. And so it's quite useful as a, a versatile viewer that everybody has access to. And a lot of uh, artificial intelligence AI algorithm developers use QPath as an annotation tool because it gives um, them a very versatile way of exporting the data, which they can then use to create their algorithms. So different people use it in different ways for different purposes. And so the last time I presented this at a pathological society meeting, it was the winter meeting, I think, in, I think it was in January, 2020. And I checked the slide that I showed and I had about, there was about 70,000 downloads of the software and it was used in over 200 publications. And so within the last um, just over two years, that's increased to more than 210,000 downloads and close to 1,200 publications whenever I checked this morning on Scopus, or many more if I go for Google Scholar, but I went with a more conservative one. And that's increasing at around about 1.7 publications a day using the software. So it's really growing very quickly and it's being used much more widely um, as time goes on. Um, I, I was, in order to make the claim that I think it's one of the most widely used software for digital pathology analysis, I, I did a look at Google Scholar and I, I took the names of the two biggest softwares in the field that I could think of um, so that I could plot them, but I don't want to name them. It's not a, it's not a competition, but QPath is um, growing a lot, a lot more quickly. And so it is really becoming um, very common. 
but it doesn't try to replace other software. And I'm not trying to convince you to use it in preference of something else that you like. Um, but I do want to stress that it's not simply the fact that QPath is free to download. It's um, but the fact that it's open means much more than that. And that's its most important feature, I would say. Um, and so one of the common conceptions I have, so QPath is open source software, and that's often really taken to be synonymous with freeware or it doesn't cost any money and that's why people use it because you can just download it for free. But I'm increasingly convinced that the important thing about it being open source is much broader than that. And so open source has a specific definition and so you can find this online. It, it's not just that the software is free and it doesn't cost any money, but the source code needs to be available so anybody can check and see what's happening. But also the way in which it's licensed means that people can derive different um, new works from it and so they can create new um, projects based upon it. Um, and it should be free for everybody to use. It doesn't have any like non-commercial restrictions and so on. And so I've, I've started to see that more and more in the pathology community. And so open source doesn't allow that. It has to be really properly free um, and free for people to use and build upon and derive other software from as well. And one of the benefits from a research perspective is that anyone can investigate whether or not it's useful. Um, so you don't need to go back to the papers that I published where I obviously have to try and show this useful for particular applications, but there's lots of groups have now started to um, publish studies comparing QPath analysis with other software or comparing it with um, a pathologist's visual assessments. And so all of these are independent of me, and so um, they may or may not show the software in a good light, um, but the fact that it's open means that anyone can do this. And I think that that's much, um, yeah, it's much more useful than if I just publish a lot of papers claiming that it's useful. Uh, one of the first um, that came out um, was from David Rim's group, and they uh, compared QPath with commercial platforms. And I don't think they, they concluded that any were, was better. Um, which from, from my perspective is, is perfectly fine, but the, the key thing here is QPath is the only one that's freely available. And so if it's open source software and it's um, comparable, at least for this application, um, to commercial platforms, then the fact that it's open is a big advantage that everybody can use it. And that advantage enables it to be potentially the basis for improving standardization and so on. Um, but in order to be effective like this, um, QPath needs not just to be open, but it needs to be user-friendly and supported. And so I was fortunate to, to co-author this paper recently from other open source software developers in different areas of bioimage analysis. And they described some of the challenges involved in making software um, not just available, but user-friendly and supporting it. And this um, figure created by one of the, the other authors. Um, shows how often these things start with one researcher in a lab needing the software for their purposes and then it starts to get a bit more widely used and then much more widely used to the point where um, supporting and maintaining the software is pretty overwhelming which is something I can I can certainly relate to. Relate to. But I think that's important because there's so much fantastic fantastic sounding work being done in the digital pathology research community. Um, but in order to actually apply it, it needs to be filtered through software. And if there's a lot less software and a lot less usable software available to pathologists, then that research work doesn't really have the impact that it could do. And so software becomes kind of the filter um, for the accessibility of the stuff that's being done in the computational pathology world. And so I think that it's important to consider the two together and to give software a bit more prominence, because if you have a research method that is easy to use, because it's within user-friendly software, then others can start to interrogate it, they can start to validate it, and we get to see where it works or where it doesn't work, and we're not reliant upon the original publications of the group that, that developed it, um, because everybody then can access it. And as a community, I think that we're gonna progress more quickly. And my approach to developing QPath is to try and develop um, features that are generic and can be applied to a wide range of different things, but in the context of specific research projects. So it's still a research tool and it's a tool that I um, approach from a research perspective. And so an example of that is I worked with um, a group at Queen's University and particularly with uh, Morris Lockery, a pathologist I've worked with really since the beginning, um, to look at um, tumor budding assessment in colorectal cancer. <clears throat> and so this was published in uh, last year. Uh, this method of assessing tumor budding using QPath. 
And so the goal of the, the work wasn't to develop um, a definitive tumor, tumor budding assessment method, um, but rather to develop a method uh, and to validate how well it works using purely open source software. Because I know there's different groups working on developing better bug detection and so on. But in order to be able to apply that, you need these really good bug detection methods to be implemented in an end-to-end -end workflow that gives you a usable output. Um, and in order to facilitate this study, we used the tools that I was developing more generically within QPath. So the pixel classifier, which wasn't developed for tumor budding specifically, that was um, used to be able to identify the buds. The density maps that I showed you before in the context of Key67 were actually developed for the budding paper. And so I tried to develop these methods and then make them generic so they can apply to lots of different things. Openness also enables collaboration and sharing, um, but that needs support. <clears throat> so there's this scientific community image forum that's shared by about 40 different open projects at the moment, and QPath is, is one of them, but ImageJ and Cell Profiler are among them as well. And QPath is now one of the most discussed topics. And so the forum originally began with ImageJ and Cell Profiler, and then their forums merged, and then lots of other projects joined. And of all the projects that joined, QPath is the most discussed with over 2,000 um, topics so far. Clearly, um, in the early days, I was answering every QPath question. I cannot do that anymore, but fortunately, um, others know the software incredibly well now and they give the answers to the, the questions as well. And developers now start to create new QPath related projects and extensions. Um, so it's not just simply the software uh, as it was developed by me and now by my group. Um, we can do much more because the people use this openness to drive new projects or to integrate QPath with open tools in a way that wouldn't be possible with the proprietary software. And one that's particularly relevant is that there's a group in Finland who've been doing some really, really nice work in applying QPath for education, where um, Aaron has developed uh, an extension where he's adapted and he's added lots of features into QPath to make it more suitable for teaching. And so um, it's particularly relevant because of a PathTalk education grant um, to be able to support this at the minute. And so if anybody's interested in this, um, please let me know when I can put you in, in touch with the group who are, are doing the work in Finland and I'm uh, trying to work with them uh, together. But, but they've, done the, they've done all the hard stuff and they've been applying it um, very successfully over the past number of years. And then I just want to end with a few words on what comes next. So QPath aims to be open. I think the openness is really important because it enables much more to be done. Um, it aims to be flexible and it aims to be user-friendly, roughly in this order of priority. I try to make it user-friendly, but it certainly has room for improvement, I know that. Um, but in the future, some of the things that I want to be able to do are to improve the segmentation algorithms within it. So what you're seeing here is actually a deep learning-based segment, um, nucleus segmentation combined with the deep learning-based um, epithelium uh, identification. And so these kind of things can be linked together in QPath. So this is not documented in the software at the minute, but that's um, the way in which it's moving. I want to make workflows more streamlined. So here's a little script that will guide you step-by-step -step through the um, uh, use of QPath for special transcriptomics and better support for multi-images, including highly multiplexed images. Um, and I want to incorporate training as well, um, but I can talk about that some other time. So there's a lot to do. New positions will be advertised very soon, um, hopefully within the next few days, because we finally have funding. For the first time, QPath is funding um, beyond a, a very short period of a, of a year or two. And so there's going to be new positions advertised, and hopefully the, that will really help advance the software um, much more quickly. If you would like to get involved, um, I hope you'll advertise the positions with me um, whenever they're available. You can download the software and consider joining the community forum. I also plan to give a, a webinar more in depth about the software and the latest features and so on around the 25th of April, which um, my task for today is to announce that. And there'll be a hackathon for people who are interested in the coding side of it um, later in that week. And with that, I just want to say thanks, um, particularly to Melvin, who um, he's, he's left to join industry last, last month, but for the last couple of years, he was the person who was working with me together in QPath and he's helped enormously. Um, and apart from that, yeah, I would like to obviously um, thank Mark for all of his support and, and you for listening as well. Thanks. Okay, thank you very much indeed, Pete. That was a really interesting talk. Thank you. Now, we're going to hold questions over until uh, our second speaker has finished speaking as well. So if you can uh, wait for your question and answer session uh, at the end, please, Pete. Okay, so moving on to our second speaker, uh, who today is is Dr. Jakob Kather, who's a physician and scientist based in Aachen and Heidelberg in Germany. In addition to his clinical fellowship in gastrointestinal oncology, he leads a research group focused on artificial intelligence 
Um, his work is on deep learning based types of biomarker in solid tumours and this has recently been published in Nature Medicine and Nature Cancer. And this will be the uh, topic of his lecture <coughs> to us this morning which is entitled Predicting Genetic Alterations in Solid Tumours from Pathology Images with Artificial Intelligence. Thank you Jakob and over to you. Thank you very much, Mark. And um, it's really an honor to speak here in front of over 100 people, um, and especially to speak after Pete, who is um, yeah one of my um, um, one of my idols in the um, biomedical image analysis space because QPath is really the best uh, open source software available for pathology image analysis out there. Um, today, I'm going to speak about a slightly different approach to bioimage analysis and. Um, um, for the next 20 minutes or so, and then we will have the opportunity for questions. Um, so as you see on my on my slide, I'm, um, I adopted a slightly different affiliation than was introduced because on, um, very soon, in, in a couple of weeks, I will transition to a technical university in Dresden in Germany, but you can still reach me via my website and my Twitter. And here's my updated email. So um, these are my disclosures. Um, let's start. What am I going to talk about? Um, I'm going to speak about supervised machine learning for pathology image classification. So um, <clears throat> what is this? Um, um, machine learning is basically um, just teaching a computer to do something that usually humans do. And um, if we're talking about image analysis, the most classical and most simple problem we, are, we can talk about is image classification. Image classification means you have a bunch of images and these images can be assigned to a certain class. And then you want to, um, usually humans can do that pretty quickly and pretty easily. And um, now you want to teach a computer to do the same thing for you. Um, and um, these methods and um, that enable us to do that really well have become available in the last 10 years. So this is um, referred to as deep learning with um, deep, con uh, deep convolutional neural networks. Um, these are this is basically the tool that we use for this task. And these networks, they don't really care if we have non-medical images or medical images, um, pathological images. Um, yeah, they just they just work pretty well as image classification. So the way we approach this then is um, we typically take a supervised um, approach. And that means um, we need two different types of data sets, a training data set and a test data set. For the training data set, we know in which class these images belong. So let's say we have tiny image patches that we want to classify as tumor or non-tumor. Um, we collect all of these patches together with this label. We um, give them to the deep neural network. It's being trained. And in the end, what we get is a trained neural network that we can then apply to other images. And then we can get a prediction um, by the network for other images, if it's a tumor patch or a non-tumor patch. and um, the way we apply this in computational pathology um, is very, very simple. And um, we just take this approach and put it into like larger methods pipelines that al allow us to process um, these large images, as Pete has shown. Um, these, um, if you scan a whole slide, you get a really, really a lot of data. And um, and the way we address um, this is typically called weak supervision. That means in our experiments, what we have is usually just a label for each slide. So for example, we have tumors that are positive for something and tumors that are negative for something. And these labels are just available for the whole slide, for the whole specimen. And still we have it we have to cut it up into small patches, into many, many thousands um, of smaller tiles um, or patches that we then train these networks on and um, what we um, what we do here is we just make the very very simplistic assumption that every single patch um, yeah, inherits the label from the parent slide and then we use this for training and for testing and in the end if we apply these um, networks that we obtain by this process on new images what we get is a prediction heat map that basically tells us for every patch um, if it's um, considered positive or negative for um, whatever feature we are interested in and then we can basically just average it over the whole slide so i'm simplifying here there are more sophisticated methods to do this but that's the most straightforward way to address this so what can we so there is so much for the technical introduction what can we use this for and um and and other people also because many people are working in this uh, field of weekly supervised um computational pathology right now um 
And, and there's basically four types of applications that people use this for. So first of it is um, just to detect whether tumor is present on the slide or not. For example, in a um, biopsy of a prostate, um, we want to um, detect, we, we want to tell, is there any tumor tissue on it? Yes or no. Um, another approach is to predict um, treatment response directly. So um, is the patient going to respond to immunotherapy? Yes or no. Um, another approach is um, to predict survival from these images. So basically, is the patient going to be alive after um, after two years? Yes or no. And then the last um, and then the last um, field of application that we identified here in this literature review was mutation prediction, or um, more generally, prediction of molecular alterations. Um, for example, is a BRAF mutation present in this tumor? Yes or no. And this is also the um, this is also the area that I want to focus on now. So why specifically predicting the presence of molecular alterations from H and E slides? So why do we think this is possible? So the biological hypothesis um, underlying this is that um, basically every every tumor, every single tumor has its own set of specific mutations, and every single tumor has its own phenotype and each tumor looks different. And so the idea is that um, specific genetic alterations cause specific changes in the phenotype, um, either in, in the tumor cells themselves or in the tumor microenvironment. And what we can do is we can use deep learning to just look at the tumors and basically guess the phenotype or give us a prediction for a given, um, uh, sorry, guess the genotype and give us a prediction for um, whether a particular molecular alteration is present or not. And um, the first proof of concept studies that have shown that this is possible were in 28, back in 2018, where um, this group from New York has shown that, um, yeah, basically in, 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 in NSCLC, you can predict the presence of a number of um, clinically relevant, potentially clinically relevant mutations directly from HE with this approach. Our own team has done a similar approach in colon cancer, where we looked at microsatellite instability. So you all know that microsatellite instability is known to affect the phenotype of colon cancer. Um, with this method, we could just yeah piece all the clues together and based on an H and E slide, give a probability of the presence of microsatellite instability in colon cancer, gastric cancer, and endometrial cancer in this case. And since then, um, since these initial proof of concept publications, um, many, many other papers have come out and our own team has done, done some validation studies in colon cancer, gastric cancer and bladder cancer and um, among others. So these were some like validation studies where we collected um, typically many different cohorts from many different countries. And then we um, checked if these um, methods worked. Um, um, yeah, worked across countries, across populations, and typically they do to some extent, so they're not perfect, but um, we think it um, it's good enough to maybe one day use these methods as a pre-screening tool before we run actually um, yeah, expensive sequencing or other tests um, to use, um, yeah, to, to just look at the agent E images um, and use that to, uh, yeah, to decide whether it's worth it to run an additional downstream test. Um, to what we also did and others also um, also did in the last two, three years was um, to check um, how, how far can we go, how many um, genetic alterations that we care about in the clinic can actually be predicted from H and E images alone. And it turns out that it's approximately a third of all the um, genetic alterations that we looked at, they were to some degree predictable from H and E. This is also compatible with work from other groups here for colon cancer, you can see these are the candidates that we identified in this study. So these methods are not universal, but there are some um, genetic alterations that we do care about at the clinic um, that um, yeah, can be basically predicted from, from H and E to some degree. One of the coolest things about this method, I think, is that you can then go back to the H and E slide and you can check um, you know, which regions were mostly predictive of which um, genetic alteration. And then you can basically zoom in and, and check if these are, if the patterns that you get are, uh, yeah, they, if they tell you anything or um, ideally what we would like to do, of course, is to identify some new patterns that are associated, specifically associated with a given genotype and then um, yeah, that could lead maybe to a new biological hypothesis. Um, so this would be the next step for these methods. Um, another interesting application is um, related to the fact that we get these prediction heat maps in which are spatially resolved. So here in this study, um, which we did on prediction of um, on prediction of biomarkers in colon cancer, um, 
and in and in many other studies, what we get is that um, we get these. Um, if we if we look at um, HD slides in our test set, we don't just get a prediction for the slide, but we get a prediction for every single image tile. And so we can um, zoom in and check um, was the, were the patterns homogeneous across all the tumor, which happens, for example, in the patient A and patient B here. Um, but what happened in patient C? So here we got um, the ground truth method. So I said this was a wild type patient, but the um, AI um, prediction was pretty heterogeneous. These parts of the tumor were like predicted to be all non-wild type and the other parts were predicted to be wild type. So this heterogeneity is this something that, that's biologically relevant or not? Well, in this case, we don't know, but in um, in, in a different study, we, we actually found out in this study and um, we also in this study, we looked at FG, the presence of FGFR3 mutations in bladder cancer and whether we can predict them from HME. And yes, the um, deep learning system was able to predict um, these mutations pretty well from, from HME alone. And then we um, saw one of the cases in our test that was extremely heterogeneous. So the top part of the tumor was predicted to be mutated. The bottom part of the tumor was predicted to be wild type. And then we um, yeah, went back to the original specimen and we did um, <clears throat> actually, actually, um micro dissection and then <clears throat> and then um yeah um and then actually checked if the mutation was present in the top part and in the bottom part and indeed the top part was mutated and the bottom part was wild type so in this case um um these methods discovered an intra tumor heterogeneity um albeit in a very striking case but but um this tells us that we can use these methods although we don't train them with spatially resolved data we can get spatially resolved predictions out of that. And um, yeah, I think from a research perspective, this is, um, this is absolutely exciting. And hopefully in the next few years, we can investigate this further. Um, how can we use these uh, things actually as tools for um, diagnostic use or routine use? Well, it's a long way to go from a prototype to routine use. Basically here in this review, um, the authors have like outlined different levels of evidence that are required. Um, until you move to really clinical adoption and what you really need is multiple studies that become ever more complex with more patients and more robust statistics and um yeah but this um this so this is a lot of work but it's i think it's worth worth doing and i think that in the next five to ten years we will see several of such uh, products um, on the market that can predict molecular alterations from h and e alone Currently, what's on the market? Well, it's very, very limited. Um, very few AI products are, are on the market right now. This is um, one example um, in the US, a commercial system that uses um, yeah, basically these techniques to detect um, prostate cancer in, in the prostate cancer tissue, in, in biopsy, biopsy and tissue. Um, yeah, so this is one of the few um, solutions which are out there right now, but probably um or hopefully this will and this will um, ex, ex, um yeah increase in the future um let me just finish the last few minutes um with some outlook into the um future um regarding the technology side because one um and one big aspect that allows all of these applications to happen in computational pathology are technical advances. And I think there are a number of technical advances that can be very, very interesting for this field. And one of them is um, decentralized learning. So this means that basically if you have, um, we, are, we are always limited by the fact that we have to collect large data sets in one place to train deep learning networks on them. So. Um, there are a number of alternative approaches that allow the data to stay in different places and then you just together with different institutions you train a deep learning network without having to exchange data so the somehow classical approach is called federated learning where you have uh, where you do this you train a model together but you have like one coordinator in the middle who collects all the information and puts it together and there's uh, somehow newer technique called swarm learning which was published last year initially in a um, slightly different context where they um, basically co-trained AI models without having, um, without requiring any central coordinator and any data exchange. And um, we tried this technology also in, in, in the context of pathology images. And this is a preprint, which will hopefully be out for, uh, out as a published paper pretty soon. And essentially what we saw is um, that, um, yeah, that um, basically if you train a network with this technology, um, you get essentially the same performance as if you had 
collected all the images in a central location. So this is a technical way to overcome problems with data sharing. Another um, way to do that is um, to create synthetic images. So there are very cool AI methods that let you, um, where you train a network on a bunch of images, and then you can take this network and ask it to create synthetic images or fake images that look realistic, but they are not existing. So these images are entirely made up by the network. Um, yeah, but they are based on the um, things that the network learned in the or original data set. And we, we, we actually tried that in, in the context of pathology where this works pretty well. Other groups have tried this in radiology and um, it also gives you very realistic images. And now maybe the final slides that I have are devoted to a very, very new technique with, well, or an extension of this generative um, paradigm where you can now, um, where, where um, one year ago, approximately a year ago, um, this new model, which is called Glide was released where you can, that basically um, has understanding of text and understanding of images. And you can use text prompts to generate images. So here, for example, the researchers just said, generate an image of, of a green train is coming down the tracks. And then this is what the network came up with. So this network was basically trained on the whole internet. So they basically just downloaded whatever data they found on the internet, text and image data, and then trained the network on that. Um, and 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 this allows these networks to be very general, to have a very broad knowledge, and to be able to synthesize images from any text. And and even um, these networks, um, these text to image generative networks, um, can synthesize images in yeah with um, and can combine different surprising contexts. So they have not just memorized the whole internet, but they have can really come up with new combinations themselves. So. Basically, you can download this model and you can play around with it um, yourself. I did that. Um, I just um, downloaded the model and gave it the text prompt, a digital illustration of the headquarters of the Pathological Society of Great Britain and Ireland. And yeah, this is what the network came up with. So um, I don't know if this is realistic. I've never been at... Um, um, I've not recently been at the headquarters of the Pathological Society, but um, yeah, this is basically how the network imagines um, imagines this place. Um, and you can also ask something like a futuristic view of the Pathological Society headquarters. You can also ask the network to create a histopathological, histopathological image of leukemia, for example, and this, this is what you get. So it's not entirely realistic, but these networks have learned uh, like a lot of stuff. So um, if you want to learn more about this, we have recently published a preprint here where we explore potential medical applications of this technology. And I hope this didn't go too far. So just the bottom line is um, technology is evolving pretty fast. I think very exciting pieces of technology are becoming available. We have to find um, suitable medical um, applications for them. And I think yeah, the only way to do this is to collaborate um, um, with in, in an interdisciplinary team where you have um, people with medical expertise and technical expertise to take these new technologies and apply them in a, in a, in a, in a way that's hopefully ultimately useful um, to, to our patients or to, 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 um, yeah, to, to finding out new, new fundamental um, things about um, in, in research studies. So um, if you want to learn more about this, this is our website and this is our team. Um, currently still in Aachen, soon in Dresden, um, in the east of Germany. Um, and thank you for your attention. Okay, thank you very much indeed, Jakob. That, that was, a, again, another very interesting talk. Thank you very much for coming and, sh and sharing uh, that with us. Uh, and can I just comment on your, your uh, images of the... <laughs> headquarters for the pathological society far too grand i'm afraid uh, it does remind me a little bit of the building we used to share with the royal college of pathologists at colton house terrace uh, but we we have subsequently moved to a more modern type of building at ailey street in london so i'm afraid it's it's a little too grand but but i do like the thought behind it excellent thank thank you very much indeed um, now i'm going to turn to the q a box for some questions uh, for you both. So starting off uh, with a question from John Connolly, who says, Hi Pete, really great talk. Thanks very much. Do you think most of your users are working with QPath on local hardware or on high performance clusters? 
How do you see QPath extending to situations where thousands of images are in cloud storage from a data engineering perspective? Uh, yeah, so I would say that most people are using QPath on local hardware. And so it, it never had particularly good support for high performance computing, but it's, it's improving a little bit. Um, QPath doesn't require that the image is stored locally. And so it's written in such a way that it can read images remotely. And so it can read from an Omero image server um, and Google created an extension to read from their cloud API. And so it has this generic idea of where the images are stored. And so that is one of the things that can help it scale. Um, but yeah, there, there's probably going to be more software development work um, needed in order to, to scale it more. And that requires the the research projects that, that demand it. Okay, thank you, Pete. Um, I'm going to jump about a little with the question so I can bring both speakers into the discussion. So I'm going to go for another question from John Connolly, this time to Jakob, who says, thanks, Jakob, for a really nice talk. Three questions. Question one, where do you see the deep models fitting within existing clinical pathways? Do they displace molecular testing or triage for it? Question two, does the MSI model distinguish germline from somatic MSI? And question three, as models move towards prime time, should the ground truth be the molecular test result or the therapeutic response? Yeah, thank you very much. These are excellent questions. I mean, this is exactly what um, keeps me awake at night. Um, so first, um, the where, where do these models fit into the existing clinical pathways? So I think we have to be really honest that the performance of these models is still not good enough for to replace molecular testing. And, um, and what should be our aim is to provide safe tests for our patients so they get the right treatments and, and, and these models are still not good enough. Still, um, they, I think they can be um, very useful for triaging and um, pre-selection of patients, especially potentially when it comes to rare genetic features. So think about NTRAC fusions. We probably can't test every single tumor um, for the presence of an NTRAC fusion because it's just not feasible because they're so rare. So if we could use um, such a deep learning model to predict the pre um, the probability of such a um, alteration from H and E alone, and then only test um, the candidate patient. So I think that would be a very, um, yeah, very, very useful um, case of application. So yeah, the clear answer is I think it's um, pre pre screening. Um, uh, second question was, um, does the MSI model distinguish germline from somatic? Um, it, again, um, very very interesting. We don't know the answer yet. Um, I'm. I'm not sure it does, um, but I would like to investigate this. Actually, we are currently trying to um, to 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 get sufficient numbers of cases because actually, what you need to um, yeah to to look at this is to have um, a cohort where you have germline and somatic MSI patients in sufficient numbers. So this is not so easy to get. Um, yeah, if anyone has a couple hundred um, patients for this, please reach out because um, this is what is needed to, to answer this question. And third question is, as the models move towards prime time, should the ground truth be molecular test result or um, therapy response? So I think it should be clearly therapy response um, because we know that the molecular tests that we have available, they're not perfect. So think about PDL one in for immunotherapy um, response prediction. I mean, all of these biomarkers are are not perfect. And I think there's no point in restricting our deep learning methods to this imperfect ground truth. So um, actually, we should train them directly on therapy response. Um, and again, we are limited by the data here. So what I think is needed that in the future in clinical trials, we um, yeah we collect the information about treatment response, we collect the agent ease and other types of data, and then train deep learning models on these data to try to predict it and come up um, with better biomarkers than we have. Yeah, okay. thank you. Thank you very much for that. OK, so next question, I'm going to move back to Charlotte Spencer uh, with a question for Pete, who says, first, thank you so much for the most wonderful software. I use QPath regularly and think it is incredibly powerful and intuitive. My only query is regarding the machine learning object classifier. I can see it is possible to assess accuracy of cell classification from visual feedback on the slide. Is there a way of quantifying this accuracy, i.e. 90% of tumor cells were correctly assigned? Uh, excellent question, to which the answer is, I think, well, it's sort of a no. 
Um, it's a really hard question um, because the way in which you would train, interactively train the machine classifier in QPath is that you would only annotate the parts it gets wrong and then it will learn very quickly. But then you can't use that to assess the accuracy because you've already biased it to the stuff that it was getting wrong. And it, yeah, it's, it's very difficult to be able to make a statement like it gets 90% of the, the tumor cells correct. And it's also hard to judge that because it depends upon a lot upon what you, you test it with. So I know that when you're annotating, it's very tempting to choose an area of everything that looks the same. You just draw a big annotation around it, but then you can overwhelm um, the amount of data that you're testing with or you're, you're validating with um, for easy, similar looking cells. And so it's very hard to come up with what is an appropriate way in order to be able to validate and get a meaningful result. And if it gets 99% right, but the 1% it gets wrong is the critical stuff, um, then that's important to know. So that's actually, I mentioned that there's hopefully a hackathon for people interested in the coding side um, towards the end of April. And I think I might try and suggest um, if anybody's looking for a project, we can look in how can we improve the validation of machine learning because it's, it's not something we solved. Okay, so staying with Charlotte with a second question for you, Pete, and she says, you mentioned it is possible to use plugins for more specific image analysis tasks. Given QPath has many of these functionalities, what is the added benefit of using these plugins, e.g. Stardist for nuclear segmentation? So whenever I was writing QPath, it was, I wanted to the idea that it would be comprehensive, so it would give you some solution to more or less everything that you might need and that includes cell detection. So I wrote the cell detection algorithm, tried to make it generic. So it's the same one works on fluorescence images as H&E and IHC, and it's, it's really generic and it works reasonably across a wide range of images, but it will also have errors. Um, and those could be systematic, like it might fragment large nuclei and that might be the really key thing that you don't want to happen. And so I want to design the software in such a way that you could slot in like a better method of cell segmentation or one that's adapted to the type of images that you've got, but you'd still have all of the other parts of the workflow, the machine learning, the quantification, the data output, the image management and so on. And so the real benefit of using something like Stardust for nuclear segmentation is that you might find that you just get a better cell segmentation um, for the challenging images that you're working with than QPath's built in. You might not, um, but it's it gives you the option and it gives people the, who are publishing image analysis methods for pathology the chance that they don't have to reinvent everything. They can just focus on one part and then slot it into QPath and make it available for others. Okay, thank you, Pete. So I'm going to jump next to a question from Marnix Jensen. Marnix says, beautiful Dresden. Uh, thanks, Pete. Thanks, Jakob. I'll go to the question for Jakob first. Can you say something about progress of clinical implementation of your MMR prediction models what are the stages you have gone through and or are still planning? Yeah, excellent, um, excellent question. So um, initially I was very naive. I thought we developed this very nice uh, model and now we can just you know, bring it to clinical routine. But then I quickly learned that this is like a nightmare to make it really a medical uh, approved diagnostic device. And um, actually we tried to to create a spin-off company and and get get funding for that but then i realized this is not compatible with academic work because it's essentially a full-time job so right now and what we did is just publish it and it's now now it's out there and i'm very happy that there are some companies which have taken this idea and now are developing it into a product and at least there's currently at least three companies who are um, developing msi prediction models as a diagnostic device which I don't get any royalties for, but still, I'm very happy to, um, yeah, to 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 see that this will probably be at some point be implemented in the clinic. Um, so the brief answer is, um, you require a commercial company to to make it a diagnostic device. Thank you, um, Pete. So Marnix asks you: Should digital pathology literacy be part of pathology training? That's an excellent question, and I'm not sure that I can presume to be able to answer what pathologists training should involve. But um, yeah, from, from my perspective, I'm interested in the training aspect on, on one of my side projects that I hope to make available in the next couple of weeks is like an image analysis handbook. I wrote one before and I've, I've updated it because I think there's so many things can go wrong in image analysis that aren't obvious and things like the impact that a threshold can have upon your results. And so I try and develop the software that makes it possible to visualize these. And I try and 
develop the resources to explain the principles and incorporate it into publications and try and um, when I have more time to present the stuff that can go wrong because in the end I've, I've got nothing to sell, QPath's free and I'm, I want to be open about the stuff that's hard and that doesn't work. Um, and so I think, I think it would be good to include it and to include it from the perspective of you really need the pathology expertise but you also need to know where the computer could be letting you down because you don't want to over trust um, that an algorithm is unbiased or objective because I really don't think it is. Okay, thank you, Pete. That's that's a good answer. So moving on, on to Barrett Jasani, who asks, I think this one's for, for Jakob, uh, is the relationship between an artificial intelligent detectable morphological trait and the genetic defect based on just the single molecular change or a cluster of connected genetic alterations? Yeah, that is a very, a very interesting question. And actually, we wanted to, we have asked ourselves that, um, <clears throat> yeah, several times. Um, we did a few experiments in this direction. And what we saw is that basically, it seems to be single molecular changes um, in some of the mutations that create a very striking phenotype, such as um, BRAF mutations in colorectal cancer or TP53 mutations in almost any cancer. These create a yeah, very striking phenotype that can be detected pretty easily. So for these cases, it seems to be like a single gene molecular change. However, it, for others, it's probably a cluster of connected um, alterations. So we have not been able to answer this, but um, yeah, fascinating question. Okay, thank you. So moving on to a question from Subhanareka Chatterjee. Hi, Jakob. Fantastic talk. Love the text-to-speech bit. In your pan-cancer paper, you talk about handheld mobile hardware implementation for easy diagnostics. I just wanted to get an idea of how realistic this is as from a lay... Oh, it's jumped. As from a lay perspective, I would imagine deep learning algorithms to be very memory intensive, especially on whole slide images. Yeah, absolutely. So these things are very um, hardware intensive. When it comes to training, when it comes to applying a trained algorithm, and there are actually ways to make it sufficiently lightweight that it can run in yeah, very, very low cost hardware. And I think it's for if you have a specific algorithm, for example, for prediction of MSI status, it would be feasible to ultimately bring that to your cell phone. Um, if you trained it before on a very powerful computer and this is something that i think we should definitely yeah work on work on in the future yeah okay thank you so adrian flanagan asks Jakob, great work great talk how do you envisage ai algorithms being funded when it becomes available for clinical use so funded as in um, reimbursed for the pathologist who uses um them yeah um I, I would hope that it's basically the same as any other biomarker. So the way you fund for, from, from my perspective, it's the same, um, basically the same thing. If you do an IHC for DMMR or a PCR for MSI, or you run a um, deep learning um, algorithm on, on an HE, um, yeah, I think um, it should be like very similar because the method itself doesn't really matter what you what matters is the result and um, however i'm not the person who makes these decisions obviously this is something that needs to be yeah where you, where you really need lobbying by pathologists to be uh, to get proper um, reimbursement then if you use these tools okay thank you so we're nearly out of time so i think we have one last question from mohammed nimia referring to the quantification question is it possible to quantify accuracy by subtracting the QPath annotated parts from a pathologist annotated parts? I think that's probably a question for Pete. Uh, so I'm not sure specifically what that should look like, but everything should be more or less possible because QPath scriptable if it can be defined precisely enough. And that's where the, the community forum is a really good place to discuss that kind of thing. Um, recently, there was a couple of veterinary pathologists turned up and gave answers to, to questions that gave us insights that none of the rest of us would ever have dreamed of. And so I would encourage anybody who's interested in applying QPath, if you would look at um, participating in the forum, um, because that's where it's good to match up the pathology insights with the software and others um, sharing ideas to yeah solve some of these problems. So. Could be possible, um, but we need to work it out. 
Okay, thank you very much. We've just hit 10 o'clock uh, and we have a tradition of finishing on time to allow people to get back to their day jobs and enjoy the rest of their day. So can I finish by thanking both of our speakers, both Pete and Jakob, for two excellent talks that worked really well together this morning. Thank you both very much indeed. Thank you and that is the end of this morning's session.